Hello and welcome to the PCT podcast. On our first ever episode, we have Rory Delap, the first team coach at Stoke City, who goes through his illustrious career and his transition to coaching. Don't forget to subscribe on our YouTube channel and check us out on our social media pages. Enjoy. Hi, Rory. Um, firstly, thank you for taking the time to speak to us here at PCT Coaching. It's an absolute honour to have you join us. Um, how are you and the family during this uh, uncertainty at the minute? Oh, oh good, mate. Yeah, I think, uh, I think everyone's in, in the dark, really, about what's, what's really going on and what effect it's going to have. But, you, you know, you've got to do what you've been told to do and yeah. get on with it. And, you know, it's, it's not going to be easy. Some people will have it tougher than others, but... It's uh, it's another another part. I don't think there's anybody. I, I was speaking to someone the other day who's um, who lived through World War Two, right, okay. and she said that it's similar-ish, but they could go and visit relatives and yeah. give each other a cuddle, and you know, you saw a friend in the street, you give them a cuddle and stuff. But says you know, this it's the no contact and not seeing people that's. That's the toughest part, and we've never been through it. Never, not had to see, you know, family members. You might, you might go a month or two without seeing them, but there's always, there's always the option to to do it. But um, I think everyone's just, just getting their heads down and getting through it as best they can. That's it. Yeah, I mean, with, with what's going on, it's it's a great time really to come out of the fast lane and certainly sort of upskill and gain further knowledge. Um, but for yourself, how are you keeping busy? Yeah, well, I'm I'm sort of uh, I started my pro license in January, so um, that's it, it was interesting what was going to happen there, but it, it's been really good. We've, we've broken off into smaller groups, yeah. um, and and doing a lot of webinars, doing a lot of calls like this, and um, we're, we're putting presentations together in terms of you know we've been given tasks to do and yeah. uh, presented them in the smaller groups then you'll go on and present to three or four others and see theirs and obviously seeing and speaking to people you probably wouldn't be able to because no one's got anywhere to go mate so yeah. people, people people tend to say yes because you know it takes up takes up an hour or two of the day and um so yeah I've been keeping busy that way myself but then obviously with work as well yeah. trying to keep in touch with the lads and keep an eye on them without being on top of them you know it's it looks like this is going to be their time off, so yeah. we're aware of the need to spend it and, and, and spend it away. And it, sometimes it's good to get away from the environment and, as you say, reflect on on what's gone on. But um, no, they've, they've been busy doing conditioning work. We keep an eye on them. They've had a had a hit session this morning. All right, okay. a group, so nearly all of them were. You know, it's it's optional at the minute because it's their time off. But yeah. um, you know, there was only three or four missed out this morning and. Um, just keeping an eye, and then and then as a staff, just reviewing what's gone well, what we could do better. We're looking at players through, you know, Y Scout and, yeah. and 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 such, but um, identifying targets really about what what we need when the season next season starts, but making sure that we stay in the league that we're in this season. Yeah, I mean, we, we'll touch on sort of that later if it's okay. The sort of coaching and how you keep them busy, but we just yeah. wanted to just go through sort of your career to date, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so a, a former schoolboy javelin champion, um, was, was there a decision to be made at that age then between athletics and football? Yeah, I, I, was, I was a decent athlete to, you know, I'm not blowing my own trumpet, but, um, you know, I, I was a decent 800 metre runner and um, decent at long jump, uh, but, but javelin, you know, without, training for it or doing any specifics or I was decent at it you know I was I was I was getting records from the age groups and stuff so um you know I had a couple of I got in the county and uh, managed to win the county championships and um I had, a, I had a fella come to me after that and ask what what I was doing and I basically said I was playing football and he said well you've got a real talent would would it be something you'd look at and to be honest, I told him no because football was was the thing I wanted to do really, and um, it was interesting because I'd just been released from Carlisle, so right. you know it was, it was a bit of a kick in the teeth. That I was, I think it was sort of fourteen, fifteen at the time. Okay. Um. So there was no, there was no academy back then, but it was school of excellence. 
So yeah. we used to go, I think it was about once once every two weeks to a training session. Mm-hmm. Um, but that'd be that wouldn't be very consistent either. You know, you you turn up and no one would be there. The doors would be locked and. Mm-hmm. They just ended up having a kick about in the car park three or four that turned up that didn't get the message or whatever because mm-hmm. they didn't have text messaging right if you didn't answer the home phone you didn't get the the message so uh, a little bit different now but yeah. um, it probably you know I'm not saying I would have made it as a as a, as a javelin thrower but certainly had a, a a bit of talent in in, in throwing things. Fair enough. It's um you mentioned there you you were at least from Carlisle, but later obviously went on to make your debut in 92. Um, just talk to us a little bit about your journey and at what age you were re-signed. Well, I was, I was there from, I think I think it started at was it 12 or 13, the School of Excellence. Um, as I say, it was, you know, it was maybe once or twice a month back then. Um, and then released, I think it was 14 or 15, but I wasn't taken back in. Um, until I was playing for the under 16 Sunday League, okay. um, you know, and the, the manager at the time, Dave Wilkes, who, who became a youth team manager, um, he, he was at a game and I happened to have a good game and invited me down, did all right. Um, and I sort of finished school, this was during my GCSEs. Okay. Um, I was going through that, but my focus really was on how I was going to get into a football club rather than the GCSEs, unfortunately. And that, at that time, they didn't, they didn't mix very well. It was, it was one or the other. You know, you were told by coaches in known circumstances that if you miss the game for an exam, you know, that's maybe your chance gone. So I, I did end up missing a couple of my GCSEs to go and play in trial games and things. But that was, that was where I was going to be. If I didn't get a club, then I'd, I'd, I'd have cracked on with trials and... Yeah. gone that route and probably got you know a job at, at 15 16 um you know went into went into Carlisle that pre-season to start the apprentice year and I still haven't been offered a contract but um I think it was after about three days they, they decided to offer me the scholarship and uh, you know went from there and didn't didn't have a great first couple of months to be honest so um felt a little bit behind the others physically, you know, I think I was was about five foot eight, five foot nine, and about sixty kilos. So I was getting bumped around everywhere. You know, well, in those days, the first team used to drop down and play in the in the youth team. Right. Okay. Um, but if they hadn't, you know, if they hadn't played a game or they'd come back from injury, you could play a couple of first team players in the youth team. So you know, you're playing your Stockports and your Marines and Tranmere's and this, you know. First team players that had played three, four hundred games, dropping down to get fit or, or regain match fitness, and you're getting kicked, kicked all over the pitch, really. So, uh, but then after Christmas, kind of clicked a little bit and managed to push on and get a couple of reserve games, and and eventually got in the got in the last couple of squads of the season and, and made my de- debut in the the last game of the season in my first year apprentice. So uh, it was 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 chuffed. Yeah, it sounds like a real sort of baptism of fire of uh, being unleashed with sort of senior pros as such. And was that was that would you say a massive learning curve of where you needed to get to? It was, yeah, because we, we had um, you, you learn very quickly that they were dropping down, and it was um, it was a league, and the club wanted to finish as high as they could in the league. So there was a little bit of pressure on results, yep. which. You know, it's probably gone away from rightly so at times now, but I think at that age, you need to learn how to win games and players that were dropping down. I remember John Holl- a fella called John Holiday um, was, was a local, came through, played a lot of first team games, but he was having real problems with his groins. And he probably played five or six youth team games with us. And I think looking at him, it was like, right, he, he was six foot four, you know, he was a big boy physical um good player and but the way he spoke to you and you, you, you know it was it was brutal but you thought yeah he's he might be playing in the youth team but he wants to win the game and there was a lot of uh, a, a massive learning learning curve very quickly as well mm-hmm. you know because you're playing with him but against senior players as well who again wanted to win the games and that rubbed off on 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 all us and 
you know, it was it was taken away a couple of years later that, that first team players could do that. But um, I, th- I thought it was a, a great learning tool to to watch them, see them, and, and and play with them, play against them week in week out. Fantastic. I mean, just slightly moving forward, ninety seven. Um, and you got promotion to League Two and won the Auto Windscreen Shield as it was back then. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about your journey to that and how that season was. Yeah, well, the the, the club the club was nearly out of business uh, the summer I joined as, as an apprentice, um, and then a, a year later, Michael Knighton came in, um, who just missed out on taking over Man United. Uh, a couple of months before, so he came out and he, he saved the club. You know, it, it was a it was a roller coaster time with him in charge, but I think he saved the club. Um, but the thing was that there was a couple of young lads got close to the first team at the end of that first year, um, but then the little bit of money that came in, uh, he got Mick Wadsworth in, who was a who was a you know brilliant coach, massive part of. Um, Again, my learning curve as a player, but came in and, and and he upped the quality, which unfortunately meant the young lads kind of got knocked back for a couple of years. But um, they 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 got promotion and, and got to the auto windscreen shield final two years previously in '95, and I was in the round the squad and played the odd game, got got you know a handful of appearances, but wasn't really a part of the first team squad, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, you know, so the year that that year after he, he left and went to Norwich, and then um, the financial situation was the club was in a little bit of trouble. So, which helped the young lads at the time. Yeah. Um, and we actually played a couple of games where I think the the starting eleven were all brought up in Cumbria, born and born and bred. So, um, you know, it was it was a great time for the club and. A lot of those went on to play Premier League football as well, so I think that was that was a massive part of it as well. But we were at, at 18, 19 years of age, so we'd had a decent little bit of experience. We'd been in a round successful squad, um, some very very good players for for the league we were in, playing playing really good football, and uh, I think we we got the the advantage from that by um, so many of us coming through. And as you say, we had that that year in '97, which is 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 one of my you know my, my best memories of football, really. That at, at that age, uh, sort of 2021, that um, we managed to w- get promoted and, and win the port windscreen at Wembley, which was a was a fantastic day. So uh, you know, you look back and you you look at that learning curve from getting in, dropping out. You talk about coaching and how players come through and. You know, it's a success and a knockback success, knockback success, knockback, and uh, but that that moulds you as a person and builds that resilience to to things that you're you're going to face in your career. Just slightly moving away, you're saying that a lot went on to have really good careers and you play Premier League football. Would you say that circumstance helped massively there, rather than I'd say talent and just having an opportunity to go and play, um, which which isn't necessarily there in the higher Higher ends it. Yeah, I think, I think um, it, it was probably a little bit of a freaky situation, really, at Carlo, because um, it, it was just about timing as well. That, you know, listen, you, you've got some massive clubs, but they're all an hour or so away from from Carlo. You know, you've got Newcastle, Sunderland, Middlesbrough one side, then you've got Glasgow, you've got Celtic Rangers, uh, Aberdeen. Um, Motherwell teams like that were, were taking players from our area. Then you you go south, sort of Burnley, Preston, were, were, were bigger clubs than Carlisle at the time. And then you know not too much further, your Manchester clubs. So they were all sniffing round. But I think because of the distance, we managed to keep a group of of probably eight or nine young lads that did have you know ability and talent. But there was there was a real uh, work ethic about us, you know, we, that was drilled into us by our coach at the time, Dave Wilkes, and I think the area as well, you know, similar to Stoke, really, that expect you to work hard first and foremost. Anything that comes with that's probably a little bit of a bonus in terms of, you know, ability and talent. But 
Um, the one thing you are expected to do is, is, is work your nuts off every day and make sure you're you know, the, you're the right type of character. Um, but yeah, if, if the money had been pumped in, it might have gone from strength to strength for the football club, but we might not have got our chance. Um, but we, we managed to take advantage of, of the situation and, uh, you know, sort of, sort of glad it worked out, aren't we? Yeah, but sort of the following season, a move to Derby came around under Jim Smith. Um, how did that come about? Was that just due to the success and, as you say, the bigger club sniffing? Yeah, well, there was there was a hell of a lot of clubs started to come to to our games. Um, you know, we had, uh, you know, there was not not including myself. We had Matty Hansen, Scott Dolby, Lee Peacock, um, that all all went on to play a good number of Premier League um, games. Matt, Matt Janssen was was a real sort of star. Um, he, he's a couple of years younger than us. He'd come into the team, done really well. Um, and he was getting offers from from everywhere. You know, Alex Ferguson rang him up and uh, he ended up going probably mad now when you think of it that we, we were League One as it was, as it is now. Yeah. Um, but, the club was sending us on trial to, to places. Um, so, you know, Matt went three or four clubs on trial for a week. Um, and Derby was one of those. M myself and, and Matt both went to Derby on trial for a week over. Uh, we played for Carl all Boxing Day and then we didn't have a game for a week. So we went and trained with Derby for that week, played a reserve game. Um, and in all honesty, I thought I was keeping him company. Right. Um, you know, and... Anyway, went back, played another four or five games for Carl. Didn't think anything else of it, um, and then was called into the chairman's office one day and told that they'd accepted a bid from Derby, and you know went down, spoke to Jim Smith, and, and never went back. I can say, say certainly a turn of, of events from what you mentioned there, from going from uh, potentially thinking you were keeping someone company, but uh, you know a, a move to to a, a big club at the time under Jim Smith. Um, yeah, your time there. Sorry, did you enjoy your time? I loved it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'd, I'd, as I say, I'd gone from from a League One club that was was struggling in in that league at the time um, to to a Premier League club, and you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I didn't even ask about the financial situation. I, the only question I asked him was, um, "Am I going to be a squad player or?" A start in the start, and he said, "Well, that's up to you." He says, "You'll get your chance this season." He says, "We've got 14 games left. Um, you'll get your chance. It's up to you to take it." And he, he stuck to his word, and thankfully, I managed to take the chance, and I played 12 of the 14 games, and to the end of that season, and uh, you know, again, up and down because the the pace was was frightening and the quality was frightening at the time. You know, it, sort of two years previously, the the real influx of the, the top foreign talent had started coming into the, the Premier League and you know we, we had we had four or five at Derby that were the top notch you know that would sign from from AC Milan and the such so um, you know it was it was another level and I, I learned so much in that three months um, at the end of that season around nutrition you know looking after yourself we'd, we'd had no facilities at Carlisle and I'm not using it as an excuse but you know, we were we were in the morning. Ten minutes before we went out to train, we go out to train, um, back in tea and toast, go in, and we had a little multi gym weights thing. You know, the thing you all it's got every exercise on, um, and there was twenty of us crammed around that trying to trying to get some kind of gym session. Yeah. Um, you know, but we went to uh, having a, a dedicated fitness coach. We should have never heard of a nutritionist. Um, but even just watching what the Iranios, the Stimax, um, Bayanos, those players were eating at lunchtime in the canteen at Derby was was a, was a huge learning curve for me as well. You must have enjoyed it and got some experience from your time at Derby um, as you moved to Southampton in 2001 for what was a record signing from the club. Um, obviously, you were given your chance at Derby. Did you go with a little bit of pressure? With the with the sort of transfer tag or 
No, again, I, I, I didn't want to leave. Um, you know, I, I got a phone call um, saying they'd accepted a, a bid and it took me by surprise a little bit. So I asked to speak to the manager and went to speak to him and he said, listen, the, the financial situation the club have got themselves in with, you know, getting some of the foreign superstars, as, as you call them in, and paying them, you know, big money. Um, he said the club's in, in trouble. Uh, the chairman was um, Lionel Pickering at the time, who was unbelievable, but his health was deteriorating so that the money sort of started to um, not disappear, but was, was starting to be held back, and, and rightly so. The, the family were, were, were looking after each other, and um, so I, I, I didn't want to go at all. And sort of the manager said, Look, there's no, there's no way around it, we're going to have to sell. There was myself, Seth Johnson, uh, Malcolm Christie, Chris Riggett, all young lads at the time. Um, you know, and we were starting to build a good side, but he said, we're going to have to sell you all. So, um, you know, but I went again, went and spoke to Southampton and um, what, what they were offering as, you know, what, where they wanted to be and what they wanted to get to. Mm-hmm. Um, Stuart Gray and, and Mick Wadsworth, who had, had worked with the Carlo, were there. Um, you know, and they kind of sold the place. I went down, obviously, unbelievable place down in Southampton, and the facilities they had were again a notch, a notch up on on where Derby were at the time. So, um, decided to to make the move. Um, you know, and uh, again, as you say, w- whether it was the pressure of the fee or not, I don't know. I never, I never really thought about it, but I think just people were expecting me to go down there and be like a, a match winner, I think, uh, which, you know, I think everyone that knows, I'm, you know, it, it's probably not one of my strengths. I've, I've managed to score a few goals and stuff at Derby, but um, it was more for the fact that I've been thrown up front or that late on in games and um, because of injuries and stuff, I was starting games up front and I was managed to score goals. So, um, you know, it wasn't, wasn't that I wasn't playing well, but, I was I was getting probably a little bit of luck from um, us having 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 an injury crisis up front at the time, okay. um, and, and I went in there and I'd been playing wing back for Derby, uh, wing back midfielder up front really uh, for the, for the last two seasons, um, and then went in and they asked me to play right back as as Jason Dodd was injured at the time and went in and. You know, although there's not a massive difference between wing back and right back, I, I was never really uh, at that stage um, a defender. Yeah. Uh, you know, and my form again, you know, wasn't great. Uh, neither was the teams. I don't, I don't think we'd won one of the first eight games. And anyway, Stuart Gray got a sack. Gordon Strachan came in. Um, you know, and I was out. The, I was out the team for a few games, but then, you know, he called me in and says, "Listen." We're playing four four two. Where would you see your, your strongest position in that that mm-hmm. formation? And I, I said, well, midfield. And he put me in midfield, and you know, managed to have three and a half, four good, really good years there. Um, up playing under Gordon, um, but unfortunately that went, um, you know, downhill as well towards the end of end of his uh, tenure. You meant you mentioned yeah, obviously your chances up front, um, obviously with Derby. But one of the questions that sort of I've got was uh, I think it's quite quite renowned the, the overhead kick in two thousand and four. Um, yeah. As I mentioned, you're not known for your goal scoring. Where where did that worldie come from? Yeah, well, I've not scored for ages. Um, you know, I wasn't I was far from uh, uh, knocking double figures in every season. But um, no, I, I, what caught, caught me by surprise is. That, I, don't, I still don't know where the goal sort of came from, and, but I looked around and I thought, well, I may as well go further forward. Uh, but I managed to see Klaus Lundegvam was in the box with me, who's the centre half. Who I think he'd only scored one goal in his career. Um, I think that took me by surprise, and I thought, well, if he's up, I'm staying up. And uh, he managed to get the flick on, and the ball came over, and it's one of those moments, isn't it, that you have a goal, you think nothing to lose and managed to caught it as sweetly as he could and went in and, um, 
Yeah, it was it was one of those. It's, it's great to look back on, but um, the the most important thing at that time was that it scored and we won the game. So um, yeah, it's it's more now looking back at it. You know, it's it's nice to have scored a goal like that. Favorite goal you scored? Uh, I, 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 I scored uh, I scored a goal against Chelsea for Derby. Um, and it was probably because it was a bit more finesse yeah. from from about 25, 30 yards and managed to, to pull one down and curl it around the hoy. Um, you know, it was a top keeper at the time, but I, I didn't score too many finesse goals. Yeah. Um, most were power or headers, so uh, I, I would I would say that's my, probably my favourite goal. Fantastic. Um, not shortly after that, in 2005, moved to Sunderland. Uh, signed by Mick McCarthy, um, replaced not too long after by Roy Keane, um, and then a loan move came about to Stoke. So you made your debut in a four 0 win against Leeds. Were you a little bit excited of about what was to come after that that first game? Yeah, I t- again, you know, I, I didn't want to leave Sun- um, Southampton, yeah. um, but the chairman made it clear that. You know, there was there was eight or nine of us that had to leave really again financially. Um, you know, but it, it wasn't a case of wanting to leave. I, I love my time down there, but the last the last year down there was was a real tough year football wise. So, um, decided yeah, got got the call from Mick McCarthy who had worked with the Ireland. Went up there, and the only question I asked the chairman and him were, you know, is, is he in danger because the team were in a real bad position at the time but um, it was more for a family move really for myself moving back up north yeah um, you know but unfortunately you know I was told by the chairman that if we lost every game to the end of the season Mick would be the man in charge and the only reason I really went to Sunderland was for Mick because right. um, you know I was confident that you know the club was more or less relegated um, at the time um, but you know I thought be a good move, family-wise, personally. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we'd have a you know a real good squad and chance of going up the season after. And he, he was sacked after two games, so uh, that that didn't go well. But yeah, then Roy came in and he made his intention clear that it, I wasn't part of his plans, which I had no problem with. But um, as soon as I heard Stoke were interested, you know, I knew Danny Higginbotham well. That was already at the club. I spoke to him. He had nothing but good to say about about the club and what the manager and the club were trying to do. And came down, watched uh, watched the game um, against Preston. I think it was. Uh, spoke to spoke to the manager after it, and he sort of sold what was going to happen really. And you know, looking at where the club was, you know, they were. I think to be honest, I think Sunderland and Stoke were like a point apart at the time. Yeah. So seventeenth, eighteenth, or something in the league. So, kind of what he was saying to what he felt was going to happen. You, you were like, right? But he, he, you know, he sort of kept his promise through. He got Salif Giao, Don Matteo, Lee Hendry. Um, you know, people like that. He promised more. He said he had Ricardo Fuller, obviously, who I knew from Southampton. Yeah. Danny, um, you know, and he, he wanted to to strengthen as well. So, uh, I knew a couple of the lads from. Playing against them, Griff, Eustace, Clint Hill, who were real good, good lads, good characters, um, and it just had a real good feel about the place. And um, you know, going from that first game, you, you could see why. But um, you know, personally, it, it, it wasn't a great, great one. The next game to come, but um, you know, they the, the went on an unbelievable run for for a couple of months and just missed out on the playoffs. But um, yeah, it was a it, it, it's hard really to see the, the vision sometimes, but the way the manager spoke and how passionate he was, and he had a real belief. He thought, yeah, there's something going to happen here, and uh, thankfully it did. As I say, you, me- you mentioned there you've you moved quite a few times, if you think about it, you know, Carlisle to Derby to Southampton, up to Sunderland. The low move came to Stoke, and as you mentioned, the, the following game was the the leg break against Sunderland. Um, so, having suffered a serious injury in the early time with Stoke, how good was Tony Pulis in honouring the signing? Really, 
how did the club look after you? Yeah, well, we'd agreed verbally um, that it'd be a permanent move, and in January, this was the October, um, you know, before the transfer window as it is now. You know, you could you could go on loan, um, but obviously make it permanent in, in, in the January, and there was there was nothing in writing. And to be honest, um, when I got to the hospital. Um, you know, the sort of pain had eased off a little bit. So I was coming around to thinking I was, I was just talking to my missus really. And I was saying, Jesus, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to go back to Sunderland. Um, you know, so you need to get my car and stuff and everything back up there. And she was like, yeah, no problem. Um, and then she left and then the manager, um, the chairman and, and Tony Scholes came into the, the hospital room and said, "Listen, there's nothing, nothing signed, but we're gonna, um, we're gonna carry on with the uh, with the permanent. You, you'll sign permanently in January if it's still good for you." And I just thought, "Wow, yeah. um, you know, I'm sat here, my legs in half, and they're committing. You know, it was it was 18 month deal from from there, so there was no there was no definite that I, I could play again. So for them to do that." Um, you know, at that time was 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 unbelievable looking back, really, and um, you know something I'll, I'll I'll never forget. Yeah, I think just again slightly going off track, the way that the club look after the the players and the people it's shown during the recent sort of pandemic, the way that they've kept the the staff on, um, and I think again they just epitomise the the area really, don't they, um, of, of what they want. Yeah, I think I think I think both clubs. In the area of, um, you know, been been superb in the way they've they've, they've treated, um, you know, not only their own staff and players, but uh, the supporters as well. You know, it's there's nothing been hidden. There's nothing. No one's had to wait around and worry about anything. It, they've they've come out. I think they've been both been foremost in in, in coming out um, and explaining the position. And listen, the, the amount of people, you know, certainly the club. Employs both Bet Three Six Five and as Stoke City, yeah. um, it, it's it's hard to comprehend really how how much you know weekly, monthly it's costing. But um, you know they, they've they came out straight away and said, "Listen, we're, we're gonna we're gonna carry on paying everyone." And um, I, I, I'm a believer that that things um, things come back on you, um, and. You know, it's so far. You know, we've had a couple of tough years football-wise on the pitch, but um, I think things like this just create a real feel-good factor about the place, um, and and that positivity I think will, 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 will leak out all over the city, not not just the football clubs. Yeah. Uh, you know, and in these tough times, you know, you, you need positivity. You, you know, the, you, you'll have done it yourself. You watch these little videos of people. You know, the little surprises. The, you know, the Tom Moore thing the other the other day and stuff like that. It it just gives you a real good buzz for if it's five second, five minutes or five hours. Yeah. Um, you know, but I, I'm a, I'm a big believer then that you know you things come back on you and um, you know I hope a lot of good comes back on the area for for what the two football clubs have done. Talking about um, good things, the following season um, was possibly one of the greatest in Stoke's history. So just. Talk to us through that season then, just how good was that team that got promoted and the environment? And would you say that in a football environment, it's key to have positivity or, you know, does that make or break a team? Absolutely, yeah. You know, you, you've, you've got to have a spirit. People talk about team spirit and people getting on and... Um, you know, again, the manager, the manager did his homework on the players he was signing. Uh, you know, he, he, he asked me, it was probably him and Gordon Strachan um, that asked me the questions. He kind of sort of texts you back a bit, like, you know, are you married? Have you got kids? Right. Uh, you know, what does your mum and dad do? Where are they? You know, uh, the little things, and you, you don't think much of it at the time, but you kind of think, wonder why he's asked that, but there's a reason and you know he's thinking right if he's married and got kids he's not going to be out on the piss every night and he's not going to be doing this or he's not going to be one you know out of 20 lads you might have one you know one or two that are, are wrong -uns. 
Um, and I think you need those characters as well. And we had a couple of them. Don't get me wrong, but uh, we no, we had a, we had a, we had a good group. Um, there was there was a couple with with real talent and a bit of ability. You know, Ricardo obviously stands out in that fact. But we had people like Richard Creswell who sort of went under the radar a little bit, but contributed 15 goals in the season. We went up, but it wasn't just his goals; it was his his work rate and his 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 character on and off the pitch, you know, he, he brought us together. Danny Pugh, uh, people, people like that, you know, um, there was a real, a real togetherness. And I'm not saying we were, you know, every week together or spent every minute, but you knew that if there was a problem or you had an issue or something, you could you could ring any one of them and they'd have your back. Yeah. Um, I think that that's the special thing about building that togetherness and a real team and it's it's the same now I, I could ring any one of them up and say oh look really need this and, and I know for a fact it'd be done um, and they're, they're all the same you know what I mean and you, you bump into each other sometimes you know you probably we probably don't keep in touch as much as you'd like but everyone's busy yeah. but no you, you bump into Lenny or Eusty or Griff or whatever, and, and there's no awkwardness at all. It's like, oh, I, yeah, I break. And you're straight into, like, you'd never been apart. And I think that that was a, a real special time, you know, certainly in my career. You know, I met some good friends in football, but in terms of a, of a group of people together, um, I, I've not had anything like that before or since. Um, you know, and it's, um, again, you probably don't realise it at the time. You know something's going on, something's going right, but you, you maybe can't quite see why. But looking back, it's it's pretty easy to see that there wasn't any assholes, there was no dickheads in the dressing room, and if if someone did step out on line, there was slap back in place by us. Yeah. Didn't need the manager to step in. If he had to step in, there was there was a real problem, and it would usually end up with that player leaving the club. Exactly. Uh, you know, but we tried to stop again to that point. And, and succeeded a lot of the time, so um, you know it was a, it was a, it was a special time. I see. Um, I think that was shown obviously in the first season that togetherness of the group um, after being wrote off at the beginning of the season by a certain betting company, um, obviously to stay up with games in hand was must have been quite special. Um, you then went to spend ten seasons in the Premier League, including so the FA Cup run in two thousand eleven the uh, semi-final against Bolton and then the ensuing Europa League campaign. What would you say your favourite memories are from your time at Stoke? Uh, I think the, the, the two that stick out are the, the promotion, the, the day against Leicester um, yeah. and the, the semi-final, you know, the, the Bolton semi-final. Um, those are the two that really, really stick out. Um, and then you've got the, the Europa run was was brilliant to be a part of. Um, you know, I played in it once. We had a home and away leg for Southampton, um, you know, when we got to the cup final, but unfortunately I missed that through injury. But, um, you know, we played uh, Stahl Bucharest. But to play, you know, the, the way they do it with the group games, I thought was was really good. We had the qualifiers before it. Yeah. And then to get to get through um, against Valencia, um, you know, and play them was was something again. I'll, you know, I'll never forget. Fantastic. I, just speaking personally, as a, as a Stoke fan, um, I always remember the Leicester game. I think, I think the whole city was was partying for a couple of days, and uh, yeah, it was just an unreal. I, I don't think from that season. I mean, the season before when when you got promoted, um, I don't think we'd have envisioned, you know, enjoying the success and some of the great victories that, that the club had had. Um, just coming towards the end of your time at Stoke, um, short loan spell at Barnsley, uh, and then obviously moved to Burton before retirement in 2013. What what would you say, Rory, was the, the hardest part about coming out of the game, having played for so long? Uh, I, I didn't find it that hard, mate. I was... I, my last six months before I went to Barnsley, um, at, at Stoke, I kept getting I kept getting little niggly injuries, and then, you know, the manager 
you know, I was, I was, I was on the bench and I was off the bench. I, I wasn't look, I wasn't near the start in eleven at the time. Okay. You know, they, they signed some great players. Had Zonzi and Charlie had just signed, and um, you know, they still had Wheelow, Dean Whitehead um, in, in my position. So I knew I was, I was not going to get. Um, but you always have those hopes that you, you can still stay in and hang in there as long as you can. But yeah. if, if I'm honest, I, I knew and my body. You know, I was I was picking up little niggly injuries that I'd never picked up before. Uh, then I, I had a hernia up just before Christmas, I think it was. Okay. And while while I was coming back from that, I just thought I, I need to get out and play. I went to speak to the manager, and he says, "Look, what what are you thinking?" And he says, "Listen, there might be an opportunity to get your coaching or stuff." And I said, "Listen, I'm not ready to finish yet." Yeah. And he's like, "Well, that's fair enough." He says, "Like, well." What about going on loan, seeing how you get on? And so that's how the Barnsley move came around. And <clears throat> again, um, you know, it was a it was a, it was a challenge because they were they were in the bottom three, they were in in a bit of trouble. But again, speaking to Dave Flitcroft, um, you know, he had a had a real belief that they could get out of it. Yeah. Um, so. I thought, well, you know, there's no point going and just playing. You know, I'll go and play for something. I'm, you know, I'm not naive to think someone near the top is going to take a risk on, you know, a 36 year old. So um, I went there and listen, the first was eight, eight games or whatever. I think we won seven of them. Went on an unbelievable run and I, I was absolutely loving it. Again, a great group of lads and, you know, the, the manager and the staff there were, was fantastic and it, it was a little bit of a throwback I, you know I don't know at Barnsley you know the, you, not everything's done for you you know there's it's sort of and I really enjoyed it yeah. you know sort of come back I wouldn't say we were spoiled at Stoke but there was a lot done for you yeah. um, and, it, and it kind of I wouldn't say got the love of the game back but sort of reignited that real passion to want to want to play on Um you know, but the end of that loan spell again, there'd be a calf goal, then a little bit, little bit of a hamstring niggle, then another calf, and I ended up not playing another game then till the end of the season. And you know, thankfully Barnsley stayed up on the last day. Um, you know, but in that summer, I just thought, right, well, I'm not ready to finish. Um, I, I, I was halfway through my B license, I think, at the time, so uh, you know, my head was turned towards coaching, but I wasn't, I wasn't ready. Mentally, I suppose, um, and then I had, had, had a couple offers, but I wasn't at the stage where I could move my family, um, you know, and go and take them away from school. And then the, the, the two boys were at Derby in the academy there, and really enjoying that. So um, I kind of the first selfish really move I made that I, I rang a couple of people around the area and. Um, Gary Rout was the manager of Burton at the time and said, look, do you, do you need an old experienced head? And he says, yeah, he says, like, come in. He said, I don't know where I'm going to play yet. And I said, I don't care. So yeah. like, just, as long as I'm half a chance of playing. Like, so I went at the pre-season there, loved it. Um, started the season again, played the first seven or eight games really well. I think we were in the top two or three. Um, and I thought, oh, here we go. And then, Again, just calf went, and then my hamstring, then the other calf, and the hamstring, and it was it, it was really getting us down, to be honest. Uh, and Gaz got us in, and he says, "Look, just take as long as you need to get fit." And I said, "Listen, I said if it if it goes again, that's me done." I said, "You know," and uh, it was in a it was in a reserve game. I remember it? I just stretched overstretched for a ball. My hamstring went, and I just walked off the pitch. Went, got in my car, didn't even get changed, and went home and actually it was more relief than anything I suppose and um, I, I, I don't miss playing at all there's, there's, there is there is occasions where you, you think oh I'd love to play today and you know you go out at the Brit, uh, the Brit and you hear the, the fans singing and to you know I, I, I preferred the little sort of hazy rain days you know where there was a bit of bit of wet around and you think oh yeah I could, I could I'd love this right but my body just just couldn't handle it anymore, so it, it was a little bit of a relief, to be honest, at the time to finally just go. Now I've I've had enough. 
So you mentioned your halfway through B license uh, at Barnsley. When was it you decided to start start coaching? Uh, I started. I think I started. My back, I did my level two when I broke my leg. Right. When I was coming back from that, so I, was, I think I was thirty at the time. Yeah. Um, I'd always had a bit of an eye on it without thinking I'd go into it, but I, d- I don't know anything else. So I knew whatever it was I did was going to have to be football related and. Once I'd finished, um, sorry, one, once once I got through and, and, and people were, were talking about oh, what you should do with your B and anyway, I started my B and um, kind of thought, yeah, I'm enjoying this. Started, I wasn't doing loads of coaching at the time, but I was doing uh, bits and bobs, really enjoying it. So I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go and see see, see how we get on. And um, I'd, I finished... Uh, at Burton just before Christmas uh, got got offers to do media work with Sky and things like that I did a, did a couple and hated them right. hated them you know getting the makeup on and I, mean, I was travelling down to London for like an hour show it took me three hours to get down there four hours to get back and I thought I'm, I'm not seeing as much as my kids now than when I was playing so um I just I just sat and had a think, and I, I went to pick the boys up from Derby one day, and uh, Darren Wassell, the academy manager, just said, "Oh, what are you doing with yourself?" And I said, "To be honest, not much. This was this was just after New Year. Um, knew in my head that I had to do something to get out of the house, and he says, "Why don't you just come down and have a look and see what you think?" And he says, "So I went down and." Um, started doing sessions with the under 13s down there and he said listen there's a part-time role available yeah It'll be with the 13s and 14s if you fancy it he said it's up, it's up to yourself and I said no no I'll take it if that's all right and and went from there really and you know never looked back I mean was there ever a point I know it's towards sort of the end of your career you went on the B but was there ever a point during the coaching courses where you felt it added value to your game as a player and maybe made you see the game a little bit differently? Yeah, yeah, but I was, it, was, it was probably a bit too late um, to have an effect because I was on the B and I started the B when I was at Stoke. Yeah, Didn't really play and then went to, to Barnsley. Um, but the way you look at the game, certainly, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And again... If probably if I had my time over again, I'd have probably started them earlier. Um, it's it's tough. It is tough when you're playing to do your badges. I know there's, there's quite a few of the lads at Stoke doing them, and they find it hard to get the hours in. Yeah. You know because your job is to play football, and you can't put that. Um, you can't put the coaching above your playing. You know, and the, the first and foremost there to play. So you've got to be very careful. What what you don't realise is. Standing there, I, I'm sure you'll you'll have had this. You stand there, and you you might be watching or you watching a game or whatever, and then you got to move, and your back seized up. You know, you get that thing where you've been stood for a while, and yeah. you know, I was, I was speaking to Ryan, and I said, "Listen, you need to when you are doing your coaching, you need to make sure you're on the move." And um, he he was talking about, and he says, "Yeah, I was doing a session the other day, and I went to volley one, and he said I thought my back had gone." Uh, I said, but these are the things you don't don't realise, you know, because as a as a player, you never stood still. Yeah. Um, you know, and so a coach, even even now, like, I'll I'll just have a little wander around while I'm coaching and um, try try and stay on the move. It's little things like that you don't don't realise, but in terms of learning the game, certainly you you learn and think more about things and opposition and tactics um, from the coaching side, but. It would really help you as a player. I mean, the, the reason I asked was I can remember being told on my level two that after the course I would never watch the game again as a fan, um, as I would always be looking at things away from the ball. And um, yeah. I will certainly agree with that because, again, being an avid Stoke fan, I then started to analyse the game a bit more and not not soak in the atmosphere as such and you know sort of question decisions or why teams played a certain way. Um, but yeah, it's it's strange because I do miss that that fan base sometimes. Yeah, I, I find yourself sometimes you you focus on one player. Mm-hmm. You know, if I'm watching a game on the telly, you know, you you think 
oh yeah, the right back or whatever, and then you'll focus on him, but you miss half the game. Yeah. You, know, you don't know what else is going on, you're focusing on his positioning and I tend to try and watch, you know, you get the wide view on, on Sky sometimes rather mm. than, the, you know, the TV angle in terms of re- close up. So I end up watching the wide one. You, you know, people go, oh, did you watch the game last night? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What about his flick and his goal for that? And I, I didn't see the. I didn't see the goal. I was watching. <laughs> you know, I can tell you where the right back was with this card. Like, but mm. uh, yeah. So, no, I'd agree with that. It's um, it's certainly you look at the game very differently. And go, going back to your sort of coaching path, where you, you mentioned the 13s uh, and 14s part time role, you were then app- appointed under 18s coach. Um, my question was, had you coached in any other age groups? But obviously, you'd, you'd built up your experience there through the 13s and 14s. Yeah, I'd done I'd done a little bit of Burton um, with the with the 15s and 16s, um, and then when I started at Derby, went in with the 13s and 14s. Did that for for six months, and then um, they had they had two quite small 16s and 15s groups. Um, so I was asked would it, would it be a joint them with with another coach um, and and join them together as one group. Um, so we ended up doing that for uh, I think it was about eighteen months. It was it was it was really good. It was a joint sort of fifteen sixteens age group, um, and then you know we'd, we'd we'd done well with them and they were a good great bunch of lads and and you know then Darren uh, moved him him and Pat Lyons were doing the eighteens. They they moved up to do the twenty threes and asked myself and the coach I was working with Justin. Justin Walker, um, would we fancy doing the 18s together? And um, so we'd yeah we'd done done two and a half years really from 13s up to the 16s, and then then was offered the the 18s role. So um, you know was delighted to get that, um, and that was that was that, that was the first sort of full time uh, role uh, in coaching. It, it was only a short one before uh, obviously being promoted to the 21s coach, um, winning. The Premier League one division two at the first attempt. How was that then uh, in your first first season of the twenty ones? Oh uh, yeah, again because um, Darren and Pat were doing the, the uh, was the twenty ones at the time that uh, they they moved up to do the first team. So they they asked me to uh, take the twenty the, the ones and they were doing really well at the time. Um, I think it was eight or nine games left of the season, so um, you know there was a bit of pressure on really to. To keep them up there, and yeah. um, it, it was it was good as well because there were there was a big squad, uh, first team squad at the time at Derby. So I was getting three or four first team players uh, dropping down down and training, um, more due to numbers really than than anyone been you know not the bomber squad or anything. But they, they always see see it like that really that you know that it's sort of a um, not great to be seen to be training with the the twenty ones, but um, I learned so much in that period of trying to keep them happy, teach them something, but get the twenty ones to do what they needed to do as well yeah. to maintain their position. You know, because you talk about development and stuff like that. We, we were told by the by the chairman and obviously Darren and Pat that we had to make sure we won the league mm-hmm. um, under no. Illusions that that was that was the target. So uh, there, was, there was pressure, and it was it was the first time really that I had to win games. Yeah, you know, I'm expected to win games, and um, but there was a couple of first team players coming back from injury, the likes of Will Hughes, uh, Jake Buxton at the time, Lee Grant, um, were all coming back from injuries and all dipped in and played a game or two here or there. Um, so it was great having them. You know. It was, to be sort of sat down again, you've done it yourself where you you sat down for a pre-match meeting and you, you've got to go through the tactics and you've got, you know, two or three players that have played three or four hundred games sat in front of you. Yeah. Um, puts that extra bit of pressure on because the young lad will just sit there and go, yeah, 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 whereas they'll go, uh, no, why are we doing that? Yeah. You, you've got to explain. And if you can explain yourself, you know, there's no problem with it and they, they were great. But um, again, um, great experience for me. So the, pre- the pressure of winning for the 21s um, followed up not long after as you followed Gary Rowett to Stoke, part of the coaching staff. must have been quite nostalgic to return 
again to another club that you've enjoyed as a success at? Yeah, again, again you know, I, I really enjoyed my time at Derby. Um, you know, again, another club close to my heart. So, um, you know, it was, it, it was a tough one, but and if, as soon as really I took over the 18s, I thought, yeah, I'd, I'd love a go at first team football. Um, you know, and, and thankfully Gary gave me the chance to do that. And, um, you know, Derby at the time, we, we obviously lost Gary and we were looking for a manager and things. And, you know, the chairman, uh, Mel, was was brilliant with me at Derby and, you know, said, we'd love to keep you and that, but we understand the opportunity. So, uh, yeah, I managed to go in and, uh, you know, unfortunately, what didn't uh, work out the way we'd liked with, with Gary and, and, you know, but, I think the chance for me to go and go and work with the senior team was was, was too big one to turn down, and um, especially been Stoke, mm. who, which you know. I, uh, but the the one thing that stuck in my head was that you know people, I I I, I didn't want to go back as an ex player. I wanted to go as a coach who's got an opportunity. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, it's completely different. Um, you know, there's been a lot of players that have um, been great, great players, far better than me, and not managed to be able to make it a coaching. So, you know, first and foremost, I had to be confident in myself. I could go and add value to uh, to, to Gaza's team and, mm-hmm. and and to the to the senior squad. So, um, you know, that was that was a big one to think about. But I was confident I could do it, and um, you know, it's probably for other people to to say whether I have or not. You. We mentioned earlier about the academy sort of set up or the centre of excellence at Carlisle and how things changed as you went to different clubs. Um, your lad has recently come through the academy system. How has it changed from when you came through then? What would you say it's better? Or would you say, as you mentioned before, like at Stoke, you get too much, you know. Where, where would you say it's changed for the good? It's tough. It's tough because... Technically, tactically and technically, they're far more ahead of where we were at that age, you know, 14, 15, 16. If, if someone had spoken to me at 15, 16 about a mid-block or a high presser, I wouldn't have known what they got on about. Yeah. It was basically get the ball, do something with it. If you lose it, get it back. And, yeah. and that was basically a, a simple... We didn't have training sessions as, as such. I can... I can rarely remember being given any tactical information from managers apart from the left back's decent you're playing against today mm-hmm. and that and that was it you know there was there was very little in terms of of that when I started the 18s it, it you know you did start to do a lot more tactical and technical um drills and, and sessions but um I don't know if it's overkill to be honest now sometimes you know I'll, I'll watch a an under ten game or an under twelves game, and you, the lads are playing. You can see they love playing and enjoy it. But then they'll go off. Uh, you know, if they're playing quarters, they'll go off after the quarter, and the coach will stand there for ten minutes with the tactics board, and you're kind of going, "No, I'm not sure about that." Yeah, Do you know what I mean. I, I'm more one way. You know, I'm sure you get enough time with them on a on a training week to get that information into them, and. Um, my feelings is that the younger players coming through now need to be told what to do rather than work it out for themselves. Yeah, um, I think that comes from a young age that they've been told all the way through what they need to do and how they need to do it rather than work it out for themselves. A little bit of trial and error, really. really. And um, I would say that's that's probably the biggest part of it now in terms of you know we we used to be able to work a lot out ourselves quicker than the young lads can now Um, and how to deal with situations that that maybe not streetwise um, nowadays than than we were in terms of you know the little the little hints and traits of of a player you know you you work out very quickly that centre forward likes to open up on his right and take it rather than cut across with his left I think it takes them and you have to show them on a video you have to yeah. Let them see it two or three times before they work it out, and then then they will go. Oh yeah, I see it now. Whereas we we were given two or three opportunities in a game where we go right. We've got. I know what he's going to do now. 
um, and, and, and kind of work it out that way. So More of I, it. I, I'd probably say that technology is probably a big one to blame that you can look back on it so many times. I bet we made millions of mistakes when we were coming through, but we didn't sit in front of a video screen and watch it five times and then look at it in a team meeting and watch, do you know what I mean? Watch it back again. You, you know, it, it was kind of gone, so you'd have to bank it up there rather than go, oh, well, it's on, it's on Huddle or it's on another format. It's, yeah. it's there. You've, you've, you've got to log it mentally. Um, I mean, it sort of goes back to, to what you said. Was it John, John Holiday at, um, at Carlisle where you had to learn? Um, just to survive, do, yeah. do you think we're, we're enabling enough sort of guided discovery for the players now in, in the academy system. No, I, I don't think, and I don't, I don't blame the coaches either. I think I think the clubs put should put more of an emphasis on just playing yeah. um, and work it out for yourself, and the coach be there more for guidance and coaching, which you know might seem. I, th- I think. The younger you coach, the more skilled coach you've got to be. Um, it's, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I think I think the younger the younger coaches are, 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 have got far more um, skill in coaching than probably um, a lot of the people that coach older age groups or or senior teams. Mm-hmm. But the information they're giving is is probably too much at times. I'd say that, that they're always giving them the answer rather than. I'm not. I'm, this, this is not. This is general. This is not saying all, but um, a lot of what I've seen, the coach gives the player the answer rather than the player work the answer out for themselves. Yeah, and we're almost becoming a bit robotic. Would you? Would you say? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's every every course I go on. Um, a lot of the uh, first team senior players you speak to. Um, Coaches, obviously, that I work with, they all, that's a word that keeps coming up. They're very robotic. Yeah. You, know, the, the, you know, the young players come through it. And again, talking about first touch, or if you say to them, we're playing a 3 5 2, you're playing a 4 4 2, where's the str- strengths and weaknesses? They'll go like that, bang. But if you say, well, what if you play against Messi? And you've got him in the bag, and then they bring Ibrahimovic on. What are you going to do? Mm. But they ain't got a clue. Yeah. You know, so robotic in terms of the, they've got the the, the the structured, real structure about the way they where they go about, and um, sort of looking at my career, I think the most structure that we were ever was probably with Tony's Pulis because we were told what we had to do, and. In no circumstances, if we didn't do that, we wouldn't play. Mm. And he says, if you give me any more on top of that, brilliant. Yeah. But it's a must. So as a midfielder, you've got to sit and protect your two centre backs. Shouldn't be a ball into a front man's feet. Mm. If it's going for the header, you were told to do certain things. If it's a goal kick, you've got to screen your centre half. If you don't hear a shout, you go and win the win the header. If you hear a shout, you protect and get around for the knockdowns and. Little, little little things like that you, you were but there was also that anything else on top of that brilliant yeah. but you do that so there was a structure there whereas now I think you, you know you speak to a winger and you say right you've, you've got to um, you've got to take him on the outside ten times or you've got to cross it with your left foot all he's going to do and try is go down the outside or, and cross it with his left foot mm-hmm. whereas you're not going listen put Six six crosses in this half, if you can. Whichever way you do that, right, left footed, going down the outside, cutting back, whipping it in or wherever. Work I think, out. yeah, they've got to work it out. They've got to work it out. But if you could put six crosses in a half, that's 12 a game. If your mate's doing that, that's 24. If the full backs is chipping in a few, that's 30 crosses a game. Yeah. Now it's a set forwards chance if... if 15 of them are decent crosses and missed the first man, the centre-forward's got 15 opportunities to score a goal. So now they go, right, how are you going to score a goal, mate? Do you know what I mean? And it, it, sound, it probably sounds simple, but I think working it out for themselves, you know, um, 
it's, it's becoming more difficult for for the for the young players. I, I was just going off track again. Um, I was fortunate enough to ask Tony Pulis a, a question at a, an event probably about six seven years ago, um, and I sort of asked him, "You're known for playing a certain style of football. What advice would you give to coaches?" Um, at the time, I was a level two coach coaching in the female game, and he said, yeah. "Work with what you've got." And and if I'm honest, I thought it was a bit of a cop out. Um, yeah. But then he elaborated and said, what's your style? So I explained I wanted both fullbacks bombing on. And he went, well, can both your fullbacks get up and down for 90 minutes? And I was like, no. He said, well, that's not your style. And, <laughs> yeah. and, it, and it lit a, a really massive light bulb in my coaching moment and went, it's not about me as a coach at times. It's about the players that you've got and how, how can you make them play to their strengths for the yeah. greater team? And, you know, look without sounding a bit arrogant, we tweaked it and we were a lot more successful, conceded a lot, a lot less goals. And, you know, it was just real that snippet of sort of gold dust that was like, oh, it was like, say, so, say like, you know, everyone knows how Pep Guardiola likes to play. But if he goes, if he had the old Wimbledon team, mm-hmm. is he going to play like that? No. And if he does, what's going to happen? He's going to be bottom of the league. Yeah. You know, you know, like I was watching that SAS thing last night with John Fashionu and you're going, if you're asking him to drop in and get hold of the ball and set and turn, and he's no chance. But you pump it up to him and put crosses in the box, he's effective. Yeah. So uh, you're going back to your, listen, what, what are they good at? Right. Players. Yeah. Knowing your, knowing your players, but. Yeah, you see, you certainly did that. I mean, ju- just a bit of conscious, I've taken up a lot of your time. Um, coming through, obviously, the career you've had and now the career you're moving through in the coaching world, what advice would you give to any young coaches wanting a career in the game? Uh, I think have your own style. Everyone, like every course I've been on, going about, oh, what's your philosophy? And you go, I don't know yet. Yeah. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? I, I think people are, Sometimes scared to say I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you only work out your philosophy, as you say, when you manage to get a team and you go, as you say there, you play the Liverpool way. Well, I've, I've got two fullbacks that can make one run and uh, need five minute break. You're not going to play the Liverpool way. Mm-hmm. So, I think believing in what you believe in and and and, and having a um, having a, a real a structure of the way you like to work but if the players aren't buying into that how how are they going to improve or how are you going to have success it's, it's not going to happen so I think you've got to be adaptable for me yeah. in terms of you've got to see what you've got to work with before you can actually start putting things into practice and structures together um, you know we, we all have a, a way we'd like to, our teams to play but Unless you you are Pep Guardiola and you've got five hundred million to spend, yeah. it's going to be very difficult to play the exact way you want to. Mm-hmm. You can you can baby step it there, but I think being adaptable is probably the biggest thing for me, and not being afraid to say I don't know. Mm-hmm. I think all of, all of, again all the courses I've been on, people speaking, you go, wow, yeah, he knows his stuff and that, and then oh god, he he knows his stuff, but. I'm sat there thinking, I don't know what they're going on about. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And you, I'm never, I'm never going to learn unless I say, I don't, mate, I, I, I don't understand. I don't. I, so having, having a bit of a conscience really to go, not be bothered and saying, I, I don't know, I don't understand. Yeah. Um, but adapt, being adaptable for me has probably been the biggest thing, to, especially the ages, age groups I've worked with. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you could have the same session for an under 13 as you do with the senior team, but you've got to adapt it. It's got to be relevant to your players. Yeah. One of the best bits of advice I was given through the mentoring scheme, and my, my mentor was when asked what your philosophy is, um, he, he just said, depends, and shrugged his shoulders. And, and again, I, I was a bit miffed because I thought it's a cop-out, but he then, he then alluded and said, it depends, and if you can answer why it depends then you've got your answer on how you play. And yeah. that's 
maybe it's a bit of a cop out from me, but when it comes to playing or coaching now, it does depend. It depends on the quality of the players. It depends on the number of the players. It depends on the opposition and so many things. But if you can answer those questions, I think you start to fine tune where you're going as a coach. I believe. I think because um, when I went into Derby, I said to Darren, I said, "Like, well, what? Where do the do you want the team to play? And you know, what formations and stuff like that?" And he goes, "Not bothered." He says, "There's the pillars." So he says, "You better work hard." have a good character, be honest and trustworthy. And he said, but if you come in with a player who's six foot seven and playing midfield and he's, you've got feet like a camel, it ain't going to work. Yeah. It ain't going to work. So, um, again, if, if you're trying to turn, you can sprinkle was it he, Danny Higginbottom used to say you can sprinkle glitter on dog shit, but it's still dog shit. Yeah. You, know I mean? yeah. you can polish yeah. a third, but it's, it's yeah. third, yeah. Um I mean just just to sort of finish off the you know the, the, the chat really, just a few quick fire questions. Um, yeah. first question. Um what would you prefer? Last minute winner to get promoted? a last minute winner to escape relegation promotion okay best friend in football uh, be hard to pick pick one out obviously Ryan Ryan's up there Higgy um, Neil McCann uh, Matt Oakley Lee Grant there's, there's a few to be fair I, I keep regularly in touch with so. uh, toughest opponent uh, Keen, Roy Keen. Okay. Best trainer? Uh, for fun. Probably Houthi. Okay. Yeah, trained like he played, and that's well, most of us ended up injured. So, <laughs> uh, worst dressed teammate? He'd be close as well for that one, but <laughs> uh, I'll Griff, Andy Griffin was horrific. Yeah. <laughs> Dressed like an old man. Yeah. Where's taste of music? Um, yeah, it'd be tough on that. Mm. What Rick probably, we've got to mention. Probably Ricardo. Ricardo, yeah. Yeah. He had to get yeah. in there somewhere, didn't he? Yeah, it'd be, yeah. Uh, best play you've played with? be Roy Keane. Roy Keane. Yeah. And then just just finally for us, is there anyone you would recommend to come on the podcast? Uh, Stoke, are they Stoke, uh, Stoke based? You mean? So Stoke based, but it's Stoke got Connection. Go. Sorry. Stoke Connection. Uh, anyone, anyone you'd, you'd like us to, to uh, get Higgy on. Get Higgy on. Yeah. I'll, uh, I will do my best to, to drop him a message and try and get him on. Um, he's got he's got nowhere else to do, has he? So he's, <laughs> <laughs> he's, 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 he's doing it. He's doing every interview at the moment. I think so. Oh, I'll uh, I'll drop him a, I'll drop him a tweet. See if he's uh, he's up for it. I'll say you've recommended him. Yeah, no worries. No, Rory, listen. I just want to say thank you again for taking time out of your schedule. I know you, as you mentioned, you've been busy looking after first team affairs and obviously joining us today. It's been a, a pleasure to chat. Uh, wish you all the success for the future and hope you and your family stay safe. Top man. You too. Cheers, Rory. Cheers, right. Cheers Matt. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed our first episode of our PCT podcast. Keep up to date on our social media pages. We'll be releasing new content every two weeks.